Go ahead, all stand with me. We're going to uh, go to our scripture reading at this time. The scripture reading this morning is found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And I will be reading from the NASB version. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who is love loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Please add um, his blessings to this reading this morning. You may be seated. Thought I knew the way, the sin. 
that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to ready for the scripture message here this morning. Just a few things that you can be keeping in prayer. Uh, they went through the prayer chain, I believe, later last evening, and uh, I did not get a chance to put it across the, the phone chain, so I want to share that with you this morning. But um, over the past several days, a number of families um, are grieving the passing of, of loved ones. I would ask you to continue to keep the rep logo family in prayer is Jerry um, passed away this past week or the, the end of last week. His service was Wednesday. Um, our prayer is that God would bless and encourage Tanya, his, his wife, as well as the rest of the family and that might give comfort and peace in the midst of this storm. Um, also, we've been praying for Brian Smith, Schmitty, and his family. Um, his mom's service will be Tuesday, and I would ask that you would keep the entire Smith family in prayer as we have an opportunity to share the love of God. Uh, that we have in Christ Jesus with them at the service. And also keep the family of Fred Bloom in prayer. Fred graduated to glory on, on Friday morning. And so if you could keep uh, Elizabeth, Barb, and Bill, and the rest of the family in your prayers, I know that they would greatly appreciate that. And so as we go, uh, we, we get ready to begin the service here this morning, I would like to go to prayer. Father, we we come to you, and, and Lord, it, it, as we speak about these families who are in need of your, your touch this morning, there are many things that we think we need in this life. Uh, in fact, it's the crux of the video series that we'll be going through uh, on Sunday evenings for the next several weeks. But the truth is, as we come to you on behalf of those families who are grieving this morning, we find that when we 
reach the point where we are breathing our last and that heartbeat stills, there is one thing and one thing alone in this life that we absolutely needed, and that is Christ. And Father, I thank you for those who have passed on in Jesus, uh, that Lord, that, that those who have trusted in the work of the cross, your work of grace for salvation, they had absolutely everything they needed when they left this world. And Father, for those of us still here, especially those of us who are in Christ, Lord, help us live our lives as if we really only need you. And, and Lord, that would temper and challenge many of the things that we find ourselves struggling with today. Um, Lord, we, we thank you for those who have modeled uh, the sacrificial love of Christ and what it looks like to be a, a devoted Christ follower. And they have been an encouragement to us throughout our years and throughout our, throughout our walks. And Lord, you know, our desire is that the, the same qualities that we have seen and, and admired in those who have walked before us, that Lord, this world around us could see us exhibiting as well. Not only as they see the faithful example uh, of, of Lord, the believers who've gone on before us through our lives, but Lord, more importantly, they would see Christ. And so, Lord, we ask as we go through the remainder of the service today, uh, Lord, our desire is that you be glorified today and that, Lord, you might minister to our hearts and draw us ever so closer to your side. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As, as we get into the Word of God this morning, we're going to conclude our little mini-series on, on baptism. What does your baptism mean to you? Um, you know that the the, the main point is that our baptism is so much more than just a one-time event. It, it is so much more. Uh, and I hope that as you have had the chance over the last several weeks to reflect back over what that public demonstration, that public declaration, you have identified yourself with the risen Jesus Christ, what that means for you and what that means for myself as well in our walk and relationship with him as we traverse this fallen world. And, and one of the things that we saw was that our baptism is a reminder of how the Son of God is identified with us. What a special, I mean, just mind-blowing thing that the God of the universe would identify himself, humble himself by taking on the flesh of man to identify with us. But he didn't just take on the flesh of man. Our second point, a baptism is a reminder of the, of the cost that Christ paid for our sin. It reminds us of the cost, not only of taking on the flesh, as we talked about self-limiting himself, but leading up to his crucifixion, we know that Christ always knew, he always knew the cross was coming, always. He always knew betrayal was coming. He, he always knew separation from the Father was coming. And he always knew that the basis for his obedience wasn't the response of crowds. It wasn't the opinion of those around him. It wasn't what he could glean or what he could get. The basis of his obedience was always the will, the word, and the glory of God the Father, always. And he left that example for you and I to follow. What our baptism is going to see today is also, and I know that Seth and Pastor Doug both spoke on, on God's love and, and being loving as his people. And if you hear some similar things, I've not had the chance to listen to their messages. I don't apologize. Anything we repeat that comes from the word of God, we need it. I need it. And you know what? If God laid it on my heart, then you needed it too. And so we, you might hear some similar things. I'm not 100% sure. But baptism is a reminder of God's great love. And as we get ready to go into 1 John, you're going to see our title this morning is Love is the Basis of Why We Do What We Do. And as I talk about that, um, I, I genuinely am overwhelmed by emotion this morning as I consider the significance of this date, August 23rd. Because six years ago today, this congregation endured one of the most difficult trials that could ever befall a ministry. And that's the sudden loss of its senior pastor. In what unfolded in the days and weeks following that event, the passing of Pastor Jim was absolutely incredible to me. Um, because while the loss of Pastor Jim immediately left gaping holes in this ministry, um, ministry holes that needed to be filled, uh, God used many of you to do just that. And, and I look back fondly 
over that, that period of time after August 23rd, 2014, and, and was just blown away as I watched God at work in and through this body. In, in fact, as those who were on the elder board at the time, as ministry leaders, we were humbled as the people stepped up to fill the roles that needed covered. Um, there were those who were like, hey, you know what? This need needs, this need needs met. This ministry needs covered. You know, I know that this responsibility is now on you, so I'm willing to take this. And this was like an hour after the word went out. People were on the phone saying, listen, you know, I'm not sure exactly how you would want me to do this, but I want to do this to help the church. And I was absolutely just blown away and humbled at how God rallied his people around each other in the midst of such a hard storm. I remember fondly as, 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 as you're trying to keep up with so many things, the people who would call like, hey, I'm in State College. Can I go visit so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so today? Hey, I'm in Huntington. Can I stop in at J.C. Blair and check in on so-and-so? And the visitations for the shut-ins and, and those in the nursing homes and those needs were met without one word being said. And I watched as something that the enemy would have loved to have shredded us. God graciously used to draw us together as we leaned hard on him and heavy on each other. The light of God's love radiating through God's people scattered and shattered the darkness of that deep valley. And I can tell you that this pastor is forever grateful to God and each of you because it really is a big part of what God used to ensure that we're right here today. And so I thank you as your pastor. But I'm grateful for the example of what Christ's love outpoured through his people looks like in a body, in this church, and in our community. And so we're going to see that our baptism, as we look at it, is a reminder of God's great love, love that we've seen modeled through our lives. And while the word of God is clear, and I shared this last week, it's clear that Christ completed the work of his earthly ministry in obedience to the will and the word of God for the glory of God. That is absolutely true. And, but there is no question whatsoever that the work of the cross was motivated by God's great love for you and I. And what we're going to see here, our first point this morning, is that love finds its origin in God. No matter what this world paints it as, what love looks like at a, outside a, a locker, outside a classroom with two high school seniors, they, they, they might think that's what love looks like. But what love really looks like, we look to God for. And one of the cool things is, as I, I think about love finding its origin in God, we had a slogan that, that frankly dominated our missions week for a number of years. And, and it was very special to me. And, and I remember, one of the, we, you know, it was, it was 100 degrees on average every day that week. And, and the work was hard, the sun was brutal, the humidity was high, and it was so cool. I, and I'll be honest, I think the pastors and the adults may have complained more than the youth did about the conditions. But there was this theme that, that to, to kind of uh, override that misery was we don't have to, we get to. We don't have to sweat, be miserable, have chafing, all those things. We get to. And, and what we found is that is the work was hard. I mean, it was hard work that week. It was hard to rest. It was even hard to sleep at night. What we found is we weren't doing what we were doing out of dutiful obligation. Like, I have to do this but rather we found ourselves doing it as a privilege as we had an opportunity to show God's love to others. In 1 John 4, verses 7 to 8, we, we write, read these words, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. And, and so right off the bat, something is an aside here. We see that what will be emblematic of those who profess Christ as Christians will be the love of God outpoured through their lives. And then the word of God says this, he that loves not knows not God, for love, God is love. And so literally, if there is not this godly love, as imperfect as we are, flowing from our hearts and lives, it should give us reason to stop and pause and make sure that we're his. 
Because those who claim Christ as Savior will model the love that he perfectly embodies. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. And so you see those two phrases, love is of God and God is love. And so as we just read by nature, God is love. It's who he is. It's part of who he is. And as Daniel Aiken shared, he said, acting in love is, is his essential character. God acting in love is his essential character. How do we know that? What do we look to as evidence, as proof that, that God acting in love, a God who is, a, a, is, is loved by nature, how can we see that it's his essential character? We look to the cross. And, and what we find is just as that youth group wasn't working because of dutiful obligation to a much greater degree, it was not dutiful mechanical obligation that sent Christ to the cross. It was God the Father's love for you and for I. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, powerful words is Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And, and he gives us a snapshot. And, and you know, as we, we are living in the midst of a very perverse world, we're living in the midst of a very perverse world. It's easy to put ourselves on a pedestal and to see them in such a downward light. And, 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 and the, what we see from the world, we should detest. We should hate sin. But we should never forget where we've come from. Because when you and I forget where we came from, we forget to extend toward this world the very thing that was extended toward us when we were drawn to Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 2, this is what the word of God says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. There was a point in time in each and every one of our lives, everyone in this room, that you were spiritually dead as a doornail, apart from God without hope, a lack of peace. And in fact, it goes on to say, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. We don't like to give him too much credit, but literally our master was not God. It was Satan who's the God of this, uh, the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world. He said, and that's the course that you and I used to walk of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Like, if you read this, this is not a good picture of who we used to be. And yet it's a beautiful picture because as you see who we used to be, and we think about, well, what do I have to offer? Sin, brokenness, fallenness, depravity. And in verse 4, some beautiful words. But God. We were lost. We were hopeless. We didn't have a chance. Not in our own. But God being rich in mercy. Why? Because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And, and as one commentator put it, as I was studying this past week, he said, Christ came sent by God on a rescue mission. He says, God wasn't lonely. He was loving. And his longing was to rescue us from the pit of sin that each of us were stuck in. And in Romans 5, 6 to 8, Paul said this to the church in Rome, for while we were still helpless, what, what a wonderful, wonderful word when you and I were absolutely, totally incapable of redeeming ourselves, deserving of everything that we had coming our way at the right time. I love those words. Not in Scott's time. Not in Heston's time, not in your time. Can you imagine as God's people had 400 years of prophetic silence, not a word uttered, thinking that somehow God maybe forgot who he was and the promises he made? Listen, it wasn't in their time. It was in God's time. And at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man, someone would even dare to die. Listen, this, this is where we, we see where John says, Beloved, let us love one another. We know how hard it is to love each other in the body of Christ, let alone reaching out to a lost world. But love's perfect fulfillment is found in Christ. 
specifically through the plan of God the Father, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a powerful encouragement for those who tend to live their lives measuring up or trying to. Those who might live their lives being trying to be good enough to break far enough away from who they used to be. But what's precious as we read in God's word is God sent Christ to die to pay the penalty for your sin and for mine when we couldn't measure up at all. We didn't measure up at all. In fact, we didn't even want to measure up at all. And he did it before we even realized our own need for him. Without question, God's word makes it clear that the epitome of love is found in God. The love doesn't, doesn't just find its origin in God. Love finds its perfect example in the sacrificial work of Christ. In 1 John 4, 9 to 10, we see this. In this was manifested, in this was demonstrated or revealed the love of God toward us. So what did God's love demonstrate toward us look like? Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that word propitiation, I know it's a big word. It might be a confusing word. The word propitiation literally meant in the secular world, sacrifices that were given to appease a God. And the people in which the, the, the Israelites or the Jews lived, they knew all about the, with these false pagan gods what a propitiation was. If you think of like when the, when the, the pagans in the, the land of Canaan, they would actually offer their children the Molech. That was an offering, a sacrifice they would give to try to appease and to please Molech. And, and so here we find that, G, that God the Father sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So literally, God sent the sacrifice to appease his wrath because of our sin. What an incredible thought. Number one, that tells us how egregious sin is to God that it needs to be dealt with. But equally important, it tells us how loving God is toward us, knowing that there wasn't a sacrifice that you and I could offer to appease his holy and righteous wrath because of the sin in our lives. So God is holy and righteous and just, demanded a sacrifice, but out of his great love, knowing we could never do it, sent his very own son to be the sacrifice for our sins. So as you think about that for a second, many of us, if not most of us, it probably had experiences where a business's owner, a store's owner, a restaurant's owner, I mean, they may have the best intentions and they're fantastic people. Like you deal with them personally, you have them on the phone, you're in their presence, in their establishment, you get executive treatment. However, there are other times when you deal with their employees and the employee may not have the same heart or motivation behind their service is the one who owns the store, owns the restaurant, or owns the business. And, and their, their treatment toward their clientele is, is sometimes very much less than to be desired. Well, we just read that God sent his son. The father sent his son to pay the price, to pay the ransom that was owed because of our sin. And while there may be those in the earthly realm who their bosses have great intentions, but they not so much, we don't find that at all when we look to Christ. In John 10, verses 17 through 18, and, and then 27 to 30, we read these words. It says this, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. 
I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. And, and that's a precious thing. He says they shall be saved, but not just saved for eternity. It's in Christ we find our pasture, our rest, our provision, our peace, our comfort, and our joy as we traverse this life on this side of glory. And then he goes on in verse 10 to say, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy it. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And what did Jesus do to ensure that we could have that life? Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And then in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I love that as the shepherd speaks, the sheep that are his, they hear his voice and they follow him. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. And, and what we see here is while Jesus came to perfectly fulfill the will of God the Father, we see in this text that the very love that motivated God to send his son in the first place is the self-same love that motivated Christ to lay down his life for mine and for yours on behalf of his sheep. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we read these words. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin in which death so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And as we run that race, as we live this life God has called us to, where should our eyes be fixed? Verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Remember Philippians 1, 6, the one who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And remember that when you're running the race and you trip and you fall and you skin your knee, get back up because God is lifting you back up. And then Christ wants to see you continue to faithfully run. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For considered him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You know, you think of those words, who for the joy that was set before him. I want to reiterate that, again, there's no question, first and foremost, that Jesus Christ was committed to fulfilling every jot and tittle of the word of God, every word to perfect completion. We also know, as we read in John 17, he was looking forward to the glory of the Father and also his own exaltation as he returned to the Father's right hand. There's no question about that. But it is also out of the immense love that Christ has for his bride, the church, that he suffered at the hands of sinners so that we could be set free. In Ephesians 5.25, we read these words. I use this at every wedding or in the marital counseling leading up to it, to remind husbands of the depth of their love toward their wives. 
this is not dutiful obligation that we see coming from our Savior. In Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. As you think about Jesus on the cross, as the insults were, were being hurled at him, as the blood dripped from his head from the crown of thorns, as it ebbed from his hands and feet, as his life ebbed away as he gave every ounce of what he had on that cross in our place, we see a perfect picture of what agape, God's love, looks like in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son, modeled perfectly by the King of glory on behalf of his bride, the church. But love isn't just to, for us to notice that its origin is, is in God. And love isn't just that we see it perfectly modeled and embodied by Jesus Christ through his work on the cross. Thirdly, with the life of Christ in us, love is is to be the basis of all that the Christian does. Godly agape love is to be the absolute basis of all that the Christian does. In 1 John 4, 11 through 12, we read these words. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man, that has, no man hath seen God at any time. So it, it's pretty neat. Like, so no one has seen God, God the Father of Spirit. So they've not seen God. But if we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. And so what we see here is God didn't just send Christ to model his perfect love so that you and I could be saved and then we just go about our ways unchanged. But beautifully, we see that God has saved us rather so that we could follow Jesus' sacrificial pattern of, of pouring himself out on behalf of those he loves. And God has called us to do the same thing for those in our lives. So while the loving of the Father can't be seen as he's in spirit, and while Jesus Christ, the Son, is no longer in the flesh walking upon this earth, what we do know from God's word is very crystal clear. The church, the body and bride of Christ, has been joyfully tasked with making the love of God known to this fallen world. Having Christ and his life in us, John Piper stated it very well. It's a long quote, but stick with me. The words will be on the screen. He said, love is from God the way heat is from fire or the way light is from the sun. Love belongs to God's nature. It's woven into what he is. It's part of what it means to be God. The sun gives light because it is light and fire gives heat because it is heat. So John's point is that in the new birth, our union with Christ, this aspect of the divine nature becomes part of who you are. The new birth is the imparting to you of divine life and an indispensable part of that life is love. God's nature is love and in the new birth, that nature becomes part of who you are. When you are born again, God himself is imparted to you. He dwells in you and sheds abroad in your heart his love. And his aim is that this love be perfected in you. If you notice the phrase his love in, in, in verse 12, in 1 John 4, 12, it says the love that you have as a born again person is no near, mere imitation of divine love. It is an experience of the divine love and an extension of that love to others. And as I thought about what, what Piper said and in reading in 1 John, I thought about the scriptures that, that I've been pouring through. In fact, there's a devotional, a 40-day devotional I've been doing called Act Like Men. And it's based out of 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 to 14. And these are the words that Paul wrote to a very carnal Corinthian church. Referred to as saints, but very infantile in their walk in so many ways. And that church had a lot of struggles and there was a lot of dissension and bickering and bantering within it. And so as the basis of this devotion and something God has been challenging me with each morning, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, that means to be brave, be strong. You know, for, for many of us, we, we maybe we don't find it hard to be on the alert. In fact, what's going on in this world around us has our alert and our radar on edge. We don't find that usually to be troubling. 
to stand firm in the faith. Okay, so we, we're going to stand staunch in the, in the faith that has redeemed us, the faith that God has given us. We're going to be brave. We're going to be strong. And, and you know what? And especially as we, it's a men's devotional, we, we tend to naturally gravitate toward those things. But then verse 14 is the glue that holds all this together. Let all that you do be done in love. I kind of stuck at this point for quite a while this week, this piece of scripture right here. Because my devotional challenged me to consider what was the basis of every word that I said this week? What was the motivation of every action this week? And the author reiterated again, let all that you do be done in love. In Ephesians 4.15, we looked at that, this passage in building the church series. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Man, you, you can turn on any news outlet. And if you have the stomach to stand everything we're seeing on social media, just read through that for a little while. It doesn't take long to see that people are really good at speaking the truth. But where we struggle is doing it in love. Love for the great God who has redeemed us. And love for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and even those who are of an opposing positions, opinions, and even worldview. Maybe they don't have the biblical worldview that we do. They're not in Christ at all. But the Word of God makes clear that God created man in His image. And He's called us to respond in Christ-like love, even in what we, what we say and what we do. In 1 John 3, verses 11 through 19, just listen to the Word of God as John shares with with, with his spiritual children, the necessity to, to live and to model the love of Christ as Christ lives through them. He says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning. And I like this. He says, listen, you've heard this from the beginning. It's been consistent. This has been the pattern of who we are as Christ followers. This is the message you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore, why did he slew him? Why did, why did he kill him? because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life. And, and, and so sometimes people have, have said, like, oh, I, I don't really feel like a Christian right now. And what they're looking for is assurance. And I love that John gives the church assurance. He, and so he says this. He says this. We know that we have passed from death unto life. How do we know that positionally we're now in Christ? How do we know that we have been born again and we are the children of God? Because we love the brethren. I mean, that, that is as clear as you can put it. John says, if you want a test of knowing who you are this morning and in whom your spiritual life is found, he said, here's a litmus test. Because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. He said, so those whose lives are characterized by a lack of godly love, just as those who are characterized by murderous thoughts and deeds, he says, they do not have eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has this world's good and sees his brother has needs and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And what John's saying, listen, let's, let's not just sing it. Let's not just say we're Christians. Let's not just say we believe in God. Let's not just say we even agree with the word of God. He said, let's start obeying it. 
And as Christ lives his life, let's live it out in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. My prayer throughout all of what we're going through, and, and you know, I, I will say selfishly, part of it's like, hey, this will all just go away. There's a lot of moving pieces as to what's happening, what's going on, what's real, what's fake, what's politicized, what's hijacked. We, we don't know. There's one who does, and we serve him. And in the end, this will all cipher out. But you know what my prayer has been for the church throughout the midst of this and for my own life? is that in the midst of the crazy, in the midst of the ugly, that they would see a body that's unified in the love of Christ. And, and, and you know, there's no question, you get two people in a room, you already have differing opinions enough that could drive and divide and separate. It doesn't matter, two of the best people, you'll have differing opinions. My prayer has been that God would draw us together. And even in our differences for the world to see the love of Christ, manifested and to be drawn to that and to desire that and to want what they find in us. Like this peace, this hope, this love, this joy, this compassion, this empathy, this forgiveness that, that frankly is not natural. It's supernatural. In fact, John said it's the evidence of Christ in us. So John tells his followers at the surefire way for the world around them to know who they belong to and even assurance for themselves, for their own encouragement, is the demonstration of love. But we don't have to just take John's word for it. We go back to the gospel of John and we can take Jesus's word for it. And in John 13, 34 to 35, despite what the false teachers before Jesus had taught, about what love is and who you should love and who you should be kind to. Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. And now as, as I paused at this, this past week, let's just pause for a second. Listen to these words, as I have loved you. Let's just ask ourselves that question this morning. How has Christ loved you and me? We are so quick to just gloss over scripture, this pastor included. But as I'm listening to this challenge from John, he's like, listen, and these are the words from Jesus, actually not John, John penned them, but Jesus said them. As I have loved you. He loved us sacrificially. It wasn't conditional on our behavior. Look at how the world around Jesus treated him. And he loved them completely. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. As we close this morning, being loving isn't something we feel. Frankly, I've been married for 16 years, and I am certain there are days my wife probably doesn't feel like loving this man. But I'm sure glad she does. Being loving isn't something we do as a means to an end. You know, we don't just try to exhibit loving behavior so we can feel better, look better, or get what we think we want. But as we saw in the Word of God this morning, being loving rather is, it's really who we are. It's who we are in Christ. It's in our spiritual DNA as Christ followers. And so this morning, I'm going to close in a word of prayer, close the sermon in a word of prayer. And then our piano player is, is going to be coming forward. Actually, as I pray, she'll be coming forward. And, and when I say amen, she's, she's going to start playing a song. She's going to play, play a special number. And, and what I'd like for each of us, myself included, is, is during the, the song, for us as is, is God's kiddos to, to be contemplative, to be reflective of how Christ has loved us, 
and then to consider in our own lives. And this isn't just in reference to the church. This is in reference to us and our behavior toward others. And, and you know what? As you think about God's love toward you, as I think about God's love toward me, let us then be contemplative and, and you know what? Meditative on how maybe we've been treating others. I want you to know something. The enemy is counting on the fact that you and I won't stop and take time to do things like this. The enemy divides. The enemy devours, the enemy, enemy destroys and he attacks. And what I know about a lion when it divides, it devours and attacks is it separates the flock and it gets them scattered and gets them by themselves. But you know what stops that and how herds are able to survive a lion attack? by coming together in unity. And that's the key to the bride, the body, the church today in this local body enduring the onslaught of the enemy as well. And so my prayer is that in any way that I have been contributing to that, that God would soften my heart through the course of this week and specifically maybe get it started through the time in prayer this morning that I would do my part to see God's love modeled and demonstrated toward each of you as God has called me to. Brothers and sisters, as we do that together, there will be a unity that cannot be broken. May it be so. Father, we come to you this morning. We are so thankful for your, for your son, Jesus Christ. And not just Jesus, as we, we look at the plan of salvation, if we were to read in Ephesians 1 this morning, we would see that it was you, the Father, that planned our redemption. In fact, the eternity past, you had already laid out what it would look like to redeem fallen man, to reconcile them back to yourself, apart from anything we could do. In fact, we weren't even in the picture yet. Not based on our merit, our behavior, but based on your nature and your, and your character as being love. And we're so grateful for that. And in love, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price, who, who was the propitiation. He was the offering that you offered yourself to satisfy your own wrath in my place. It's an incredible thought. As much as you hate sin, you also loved us enough to, to, to satisfy your own wrath by the sending of your own son as the sacrifice. But it wasn't out of dutiful obligation that Jesus died on our behalf. As God himself, it was out of his great love for us that he laid down his life for his bride, the church. We are so thankful that you've done that. We're grateful for the Holy Spirit of God that when Jesus ascended uh, at Pentecost, Jesus sent just as he said he would. And the Holy Spirit fills our hearts, not only convicting us of sin, but conforming us to the very image of Christ. And part of that, Lord, is, is the love that needs to be demonstrated and shown by this man and by each of us in this room. And Lord God, I thank you as much as it's hard to thank you sometime for the tests in this life. But Lord, through the troubled days that we've experienced the last five months, you have graciously You've tested our metal. You've shown us where we are and who we are. And as, as much as we don't like to look at that sometimes, it's a good thing. And you're gracious to allow us to come to you, to repent and to turn from the areas of brokenness in our lives. And through your Spirit's power and his leading and, and direction in our lives, we can continue to walk the path you set for us. And my prayer is that we would. And so Lord, as we go to prayer here this morning as Robin plays, would you graciously, lovingly, Lord, Lord, mercifully remind us and bring to the forefront of our hearts those areas where we've been struggling. Lord, knowing that in your great love, the God who redeemed us desires to restore us and to continue to refine us. And Lord, our ultimate desire is to bring you glory. It's to build up the saints. But Father God, we want the hurting and the lost around us to know there is something different about those people, Christians. And Lord, as your life is lived out through us, as we humbly and willingly yield and submit, may it be so. And may some of that work begin even this morning. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Thank you.